A show that's endured as much cultural and societal changes as Doctor Who is bound to have attracted its fair share of controversies over the years. Not all controversies are created equal, however, and some of them just weren't worth all the fuss that they created. I'm Ellie for Who Culture here with the 10 dumbest Doctor Who controversies. Number 10. Peter Capaldi is too old to play the Doctor. In 2013, it was announced that one of the UK's greatest actors and major star of the BBC's foul-mouthed comedy hit The Thick of It would be the next Doctor Who. It was an incredible bit of casting that felt like an extra special 50th anniversary present. Or at least it was if you weren't one of the ages trolls scuttling around in the rocks upturned by the Daily Mail in the wake of Capaldi's casting announcement. Too old, same age as the first Doctor in 1908. All the others were more than 10 years younger, said a user called Shirley. 1919. Bit rich from somebody born in 1919, Shirley. Meanwhile, another user was disappointed that the Doctor wouldn't be, quote, cute anymore, while another claimed that the Doctor, quote, needed to be someone younger and more attractive to keep Doctor Who relevant. Oh, right, yeah, you do have a point. Because it's not like the show became a pop culture juggernaut under a 55-year-old or anything. Oh, wait. It's tempting to ponder if these lunatic responses led to Stephen Moffat making such a huge deal about the 12th Doctor not being Clara's boyfriend anymore, although it does seem quite likely. Number 9. Scotland Yard versus the Autons Doctor Who's countless bug-eyed monsters have been making families hide behind the sofa for decades. Everything from the Daleks to the Empress of the Rachnos has been dubbed too scary for kids by the press. And in the early 1970s, even the authorities were getting involved. Following the broadcast of Terror of the Autons Part 2 cliffhanger, in which the third Doctor and Joe discover that the policemen who saved them are actually Autons, Scotland Yard wrote a letter of complaint to the BBC, lamenting this depiction of policemen as terrifying aliens. And according to Dominic Sandbrook's retrospective on early 70s Britain in his book State of Emergency, this issue was even debated in the House of Lords. It's certainly a spooky moment, but all the fuss seemed a little bit much. Though it is telling that this was the last we saw of these Auton coppers, and the Autons themselves for that matter, at least until the revived series. So maybe Scotland Yard's feedback was taken on board after all. Number 8. The Unquiet Dead is Too Scary for Kids And speaking of hiding behind the sofa, it only took three episodes of Doctor Who's 21st Century Revival to face the wrath of concerned parents. Written by Mark Gatiss, The Unquiet Dead was singled out for being too scary. Given the traditional vibe of Gatiss' debut Doctor Who episode, he must have been tickled by the fact that his 2005 effort was getting under the skin of the 21st Century's Mary Whitehouses. 91 viewers complained to the BBC after The Unquiet Dead aired, resulting in the corporation releasing a statement a few days later, which suggested that Doctor Who was aimed at, quote, children aged eight and above who should watch the show with their parents. Commenters highlighted that being scared by Doctor Who is the whole point, with one explaining, quote, I watched Doctor Who as a child and I loved all the scary bits. The scare factor was the whole point of the show back in the 70s. You always knew that the Doctor would win in the end. I would have thought that children have seen far worse on TV these days. With its gelf zombies, The Unquiet Dead is certainly the most horrific of Christopher Eccleston's first three episodes. But also, it's a bunch of Welsh extras with pallid complexions and blue contact lenses milling around a cellar. The Walking Dead? This is not. Number 7. The Daleks in Colour When it was announced that 1963's The Daleks would be colourised and edited down to 75 minutes, Doctor Who fandom was characteristically calm, collected and (laughs) open-minded. Of course it wasn't! Benjamin Cook's frenetically edited version of the debut Dalek serial was not without its problems. Firstly, we already kind of have a 75-minute full-colour version of The Daleks, it's just that it stars Peter Cushing and Roy Castle instead of William Hartnell and William Russell. It also had an over-reliance on flashbacks to things we'd just seen several minutes ago to smooth over difficult transitions. But ultimately, it's not replacing the original. If fans still want to watch the broadcast version of the Daleks, they can do so on physical media or on BBC iPlayer. And yet, in some of the internet's darker corners, old school fans began voicing concerns that these new whiz-bang colorized re-edits would eventually replace the real deal. Quite how that would work is anyone's guess, but needless to say, if you see Russell T Davis marching up your driveway with a bin liner, it might be wise to hide your DVD of the Daleks. Number 6. The Sonic Sunglasses 
With his electric guitar and adoption of the word dude, the Twelfth Doctor's midlife crisis was a bit too much for some fans to bear. However, the biggest concern was with his choice of eyewear, the sonic sunglasses. Predictably, fans freaked out about this heretical change to the Doctor's accessory of choice. As one laid-back and easy-going fan put it on Twitter, quote, The only thing Doctor Who fans hate more than Moffat is the new sonic sunglasses. Ooh, ouch! But let's look at the story reasons why the Doctor rejects the screwdriver. It's become interesting intrinsically linked to his shame at abandoning Davros as a child in the middle of a war zone. This is at the start of a series that breaks down the Doctor and builds him back up again, so he has to earn the sonic screwdriver at the end of the final episode. And did we really think that that was going to be it for the sonic screwdriver? Classic example of fans jumping to wild, furious conclusions at the start of a series. At least he wasn't still calling his new sonic shades a sonic screwdriver like the 15th Doctor does with that weird magic remote control that he waves about. That is not a sonic Sonic screwdriver. Although, to be fair, I also wasn't a massive fan of the sunglasses either. I mean, what is wrong with just a standard screwdriver, people? Number 5. Ace's Hairy Armpits There's a real anti-establishment undercurrent to the latter years of classic Doctor Who. From script editor Andrew Cartmel reportedly telling producer John Nathan Turner that he wanted to quote, overthrow the government, to Sylvester McCoy's history with the anarchic Ken Campbell Roadshow. However, the most strangely controversial addition to the McCoy era was Sophie Aldred's hairy armpits. As Aldred remembered in a 2008 interview with Den of Geek, her history as a radical feminist while studying at Manchester initially put her at odds with Nathan Turner. It's certainly funny to imagine Aldred, who came from working-class Manchester clubs, replacing theatre darling Bonnie Langford, which is something that Nathan Turner initially struggled to reconcile. As Aldred recalled, saying, quote, At first it was awful. He didn't really understand me, because he came from the world of Joan Collins-ish type glamour, the Kate O'Maras of this world, and Bonnie Langford, and he didn't really understand at all why I didn't want to shave my armpits. This armpit controversy didn't last long, however, and she and Nathan Turner Turner soon became great friends. And if anything, Aldred's decision not to shave her armpits was perfectly on brand for a right-on feminist action hero like Ace. Number 4. Daleks Torture Scenes It might not seem like a big deal nowadays, but the British Board of Film Classification's decision to award Dalek a 12 rating on DVD in 2005 made the news. Previously, the only Doctor Who story to receive a 12 certificate was the TV movie, mainly due to all that gun violence at the start. The BBFC stated that Dalek promotes, quote, violence and cruelty as a way of dealing with problems, which it absolutely doesn't. A Dalek ultimately rejects violence by ending its life and ascends to a higher level of being, for goodness sake. They were also concerned that the Doctor, a role model for children, used torture and intimidation tactics towards a, oh, let's, sorry, let me just check my notes, um, a Dalek. Writer Robert Shearman said that he was even asked to appear on Breakfast TV to discuss the violence in the episode, a request that he rightly turned down. Nineteen years later, it all feels like a storm in a teacup, especially when you consider the types of Doctor Who stories being passed by the BBFC around the same time. The Deadly Assassin, which includes the fourth Doctor being drowned, shot at, and trapped in some rail tracks, was given a PG rating upon its DVD release in 2009. Huh, go figure. Number 3. Vastra and Jenny Kiss Complaints The funny thing about Doctor Who controversies is that they often generate some utterly wild headlines, like this one from 2015. Doctor Who lesbian lizard kiss will not face investigation. Wow, okay then. Well, this referred to Ofcom receiving six complaints about Madame Vastra and Jenny kissing in the 2014 episode Deep Breath. The six complaints stated that the kiss was, quote, gratuitous and unnecessary. In response, Ofcom rightly told them to shut the hell up. While it's heartening that only six out of nine point one million viewers watching Deep Breath felt the need to complain about this, it's still depressing that it garnered headlines. Especially when you consider that it wasn't even a kiss, it was an oxygen transfer to keep Jenny alive, for goodness sake. It seems a select few were so blinded by needless rage that they weren't actually paying attention to the plot. Regardless of whether the six complaints were rooted in a fear of lizards or lesbians, love is love. There's nothing gratuitous or unnecessary about a married couple sharing what might be their last intimate moment during a life-threatening situation. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Number two, female doctor makes young men criminals. Hmm. 
In 2021, it was claimed that prominent female characters in pop culture, including Daisy Ridley's role in Star Wars, along with Jodie Whittaker's casting as the Doctor, had created a dearth of positive male role models, forcing young men to switch over to Peaky Blinders and take up crime instead. This was the insane claim made by former Tory MP Nick Fletcher at a Westminster debate marking International Men's Day. Fletcher's bizarre statement was apparently met by bafflement from his fellow MPs, presumably because it's a much more complex situation, as Labour MP Annalise Dodds, now serving as Minister of State for Women and Equalities, pointed out. Jodie Whittaker's doctor didn't oversee a massive rise in child poverty, nor did she slash funding for initiatives to give young men a better chance in life. She's an actress, playing a fictional character, I might add. And what does it say about Fletcher's view of gender politics that he believes that boys don't have it in them to look up to women as heroes? The 13th Doctor and the female Ghostbusters didn't turn young men into criminals, just as much as Ellen Ripley, Sarah Connor, Rose Tyler and Martha Jones didn't. Number 1. Doctor Who's Anti-Ginger Agenda The 11th Doctor's post-regenerative disappointment at not being a redhead was deemed by some to be evidence of an anti-ginger agenda on the part of the Doctor Who production team. It's unclear if those complaining had misheard Matt Smith's disappointed delivery as an insult, or if they were actively upset that, once again, a brown-haired actor had been cast as the Doctor. Either way, these 143 hot-headed redheads wrote to the BBC with their concerns, forcing the corporation to write this hilarious response. Quote, We would like to reassure viewers the Doctor Who doesn't have an anti-ginger agenda whatsoever. This was a reprise of the line in the Christmas Invasion episode in 2005, when David Tennant discovers he's not ginger. And here he is, missing out again. Disappointed, he's still not ginger. The BBC also pointed out that the 10th Doctor's last full-time companion and the 11th Doctor's future companion were also ginger. No anti-ginger bias there then. That said, four regenerations and two forgotten Doctors later, and there still isn't a red-headed Doctor. Is Time Lord DNA just unable to replicate ginger hair? And that concludes our list. While we're on the subject of the Doctor's regenerations, though, why not check out every version of the Doctor explained? And no, none of them are ginger. In the meantime, I've been Ellie for Who Culture, and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye, sweeties.